We are on week five, and 2 Samuel 7 is our main uh, scripture this week, although the author had us jumping all over the place, which was great. It was kind of like, you know, getting our use of our sword. We were learning um, all these different books of the Bible to look up and where they are in different stories and different histories, so I really, really enjoyed that. hope you guys did too. The title of this week is Jesus the King Forever. And so far in our study, Discovering Jesus in the Old Testament, that's the book that we're going through, we've explored how Jesus is the serpent crusher, the sacrificed lamb, the sacrificed son, the afflicted one, and now this week he is the king forever. So if you would turn to chapter 5, page 77, in the book, and if you don't have one, no worries. That's the beauty of the study that we're doing this time around is if you have the book, great. If not, you're not going to miss out on anything because each week we're going to give you a really good just broad overview and then break into small groups to delve more into um, the portion of Scripture and the Bible study, but you don't need to have the book. So don't keep that, have that, you know, keep you from coming. So, and sometimes, too, life gets busy and you don't get all your homework done. It's okay. Come. Okay, we'll fill you in, we'll fill you in the details, don't worry about it. All right, Um, the authors of this book provide a great background information in the reveal section. Each chapter breaks down kind of what's going on in the history of the Bible here as it pertains to the theme of that week. So we see in Eve's day that God created humans to rule the earth under him as vice regents. Uh, Sin was introduced and desecrated God's plan for his creation through Adam and Eve, but God loved us so much that he constructed a redemption plan. And Jesus coming to earth was that plan. I love when uh, Wendy reads to us out of the Jesus Story Bible, how that redemption plan is is weaved throughout the entire story of the Bible. It's a children's Bible, it's really great. Um, We read it to our daughter when she was young and it's, it's a really beautiful gift. If you're looking for a gift for a grandchild or niece or nephew, highly recommend it, it's great. In Abraham's day, we learn the meaning behind the title King of Kings, which this was interesting. We learn that back in the day, there was usually one powerful king that reigned supreme over all these other smaller sovereigns that just ruled over cities or certain um, counties or, or different provinces. But then there was one supreme king who was the King of Kings. Um, Genesis 17.6 God promised that some of Abraham's descendants would be kings. And this promise was fulfilled as all Israelites and Jews are descendants and children of Abraham. In Moses' day, God was the king of Israel. But he knew that future kings would rule on the earth over his people. So he gave them requirements that needed to be met by future kings in Deuteronomy 17, 14 through 20. It's interesting, I've been taught, and you guys might have been in the past, that Israel was in sin or they were disobedient and requesting a king. I was always taught that, you know, it was um, a a wrong thing for them to say, "Well, well, give us a king, we want a king. But it's actually incorrect because God wanted the Israelites to have a king. He just had certain criteria in mind. If it was them being disobedient or sinful, he would have never given them criteria for a king. So I thought that that was kind of a little interesting. The problem was that they ignored God's choice for a king. And we see that in 1 Samuel 8, 4. It says, so all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, you're old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us such as all the other nations have. So right there is where they went wrong. They wanted what everybody else had, right? But God called his people to be set apart, to be a holy nation, and they wanted what everybody else had. Samuel warned them that a king would subject them to his authority, and they responded in verse 19. uh, But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all other nations with a king to lead us and go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel heard all the people had said, he repeated it before the Lord, and the Lord answered, Listen to them and give them a king. You ever heard the saying, be careful what you wish for? Because you might just get it. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's what happened. They wanted a king to rule over them, and God 
gave them what they asked for. This would have been really good advice for the Israelites to heed. They chose Saul to be their king. He was a man, though, that was self-seeking and sought after his own selfish desires. But God chose David. And David is described as what? A man after God's own heart, right? That's in 1 Samuel 13, 14. I don't know about you, but anytime God gives exact requirements for a situation or position, it's probably pretty important to follow those those instructions to a T. Don't you think? (laughs) If you would, turn with me to Deuteronomy 17. We're going to start in verse 14 and read about those requirements that God gave them. 17, 14. Okay. It says, when you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you and have taken possession of it and settled in it, and you say, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us. Here he's telling them exactly what they're going to say, and they actually say it word for word, right? Be sure, verse 15, to appoint over you a king the Lord your God chooses. He must be from among your fellow Israelites, that's number one. Do not place a foreigner over you or one who is not an Israelite. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself, number two, or make people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. Number three, he must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. Number four, he must not accumulate large amounts of silver or gold. When he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to, number five, write for himself on a scroll a copy of the law taken from that of the Levitical priests. It is to be with him, and he is, number six, to read it all the days of his life, so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees. And, number seven, not consider himself better than his fellow Israelites and turn from the law to the right or the left. Then he and his descendants will reign a long time over his kingdom in Israel. The Lord's commands always come with a promise. He is a fair and just God. He doesn't ever put unrealistic requirements on us or he he didn't do that on them. He tells them, here's what I require, and if your king does all of this and obeys these requirements, he and his descendants will reign for a long time over his kingdom. But unfortunately, this didn't happen. Like we said, the people chose Saul. He looked good on the outside. He had all the exterior qualities. He came from a good lineage. He was tall. He was handsome. He was physically impressive. They thought... He's our guy. We want him to lead us into battle. We want when other nations look at him to go, ooh, he looks like a king. And that's why they picked him. It was based on his outward appearance. However, he lacked humility, honesty, temperance, and was disobedient to God's instructions. God chose David. He was an unlikely candidate on the outside, He was young and experienced and a shepherd, which was like one of the lowliest, you know, professions back in the day. But that didn't matter to God. 1 Samuel 16, 7 tells us, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And this verse is specifically spoken when Samuel is looking to anoint the next king of Israel. And he's going through all of David's brothers. And he's like, this one, Lord? Nope, not that one. This one? Nope. not. But Lord, this one? Nope, not that one. And he said, man looks at the outward, but I look at the heart. And then he saw David and God said, he's the one. God saw all the right characteristics. David had a love for the Lord and an ultimate dependence on him. Think about even when he was fighting um, the, the lion in the wilderness to protect his sheep. Or extraordinary courage and faith in God's power. Remember when he went in front of Goliath and he's like, I don't come to you with weapons. I come to you in the name of the Lord, right? You're going down. I love that. He, he was confident. Here's this little kid, you know, they say he was about a teenager. And he's like, all the other soldiers were so scared. Saul was even scared and petrified. And he, he's like, y'all, don't you worry about it. We're, going, we're God's people. 
we're going on. God's going to go before us and he's going to give us, you know, who is this Goliath that's slandering God's name? We go on in the power of our God and he's going to grant us victory. I want that kind of faith. Don't y'all? Big time. Like, like hey, God's going before us. We've, we've already won. God's, God's for us, right? Um, David loved the Lord with all his heart and God blessed him for that. We see in our scriptures this week that it bothered David that he, as a human, lived in a house. But the Ark of the Covenant only had a tent. And the Ark of the Covenant is very important and significant because this tangible physical item was the exact place that God's spirit would come and hover over and dwell among the people. So he's like, Lord, this special artifact where you bring your presence to fall, it's in a tent. How can I live in a house? That, that's not right. So now let's turn to 2 Samuel 7. And we're going to start in verse 8. And this is our main portion of scripture tonight. And I will read it from my notes as well. Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture from tending the flock and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth, and I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Verse 14, I will be his father and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. What a beautiful portion of scripture. These are the promises that God is giving David for following him and loving him and for his heart to honor the Lord. And this portion of scripture is known as the Davidic covenant because these are the promises that God gave King David. However, David is not going to build the temple. He's not going to build the house of the Lord. His son will be the one to carry on that task. And Solomon who happens to be the son of he and who? Bathsheba is chosen. He's going to be the heir to the throne, not his older brothers. And I was talking to the girls earlier as well and just said, I, I love that story of God's redemption even through that. Um, as you guys may or may not know, David and Bathsheba, it was an adulterous relationship that ended up that then David had her husband killed. It was horrible. Um, he then did take Bathsheba as his wife and Solomon is a product of their union. And now he's going to be the one that God chooses to build his house. And that's just such an encouragement that God can redeem any situation. They were both repentant. David and Bathsheba were repentant. And um, God, you know, redeemed that and brought them Solomon. And through the lineage of David, ultimately the Messiah comes. But Solomon is going to be the one to build the temple. God was pleased with this decision, and it's interesting, in our book, I, it said this, and I was like, wow, that's really cool, that Solomon was both David, his dad's choice for king, but also God's choice, because back when, um, if the priest anointed the future king, it was the, the known heir to the throne, it was the father's choice, and the priest would anoint them as king. If it was God's choice, the prophet would anoint the future king. So with Solomon, Zadok, the priest, anointed him, showing David's approval. And then the prophet Nathan 
anointed him, showing God's approval. So he really was the chosen heir of David. David then gave Solomon the exact instructions, detail for detail, as to how the Lord wanted the temple um, to be built. And Solomon was blessed by the Lord just like his father. So Solomon's temple, I had fun with this one. I thought, you know what, let me do a little research and see, you know, if we were to build the temple in today's time, what would it take and how much would it cost? We've all heard that the price of lumber has gone up, right? So I'm like, hmm, let's do a little math. And the Internet has a lot of crazy things, but has a lot of good things on there too. So I was able to find out some information. <laughs> the temple took seven years to build, and there were thousands of craftsmen and laborers that had to build the temple. It was primarily made of wood, stone, silver, and gold. So I thought it would be interesting to break down the quantity and cost of just the materials. So this isn't talking with, you know, how much the laborers were paid or how much whatever. This is just the materials if we were to build the temple today. There were approximately 50,000 square feet of wood and stone. Today's average price is about $15 per square foot for a total of $750,000. So a quarter million dollars just for the wood and stone. There were 3,000 tons of silver. As of yesterday, the price of silver is $23.54 an ounce. So 3,000, I did not do the math. Again, thank God for computers. <laughs> Breaking down tons into ounces gave us a total of, let me get this right, 5291 dollars of silver. Now... There were also 3,000 tons of gold. And I don't know if you've looked up the current price of gold, but I did as of yesterday. An ounce of gold. So girls, if you have any junk jewelry, you need to go turn it in. Because <laughs> gold is $1,813 an ounce. So multiply that by 3,000 tons. We have... The cost to build the temple today with all the gold would have been $191,851,851,852. So for a grand total of just the um, supplies alone, the materials alone, would be 194 billion, 343 million, 607,000, $143. Can you imagine what that temple must have looked like? I can't even. And I know that no artist rendering that we've seen could even compare, you know. Um, I also saw in a video that I watched that the cost to build the temple was equivalent to the cost of building 28 Egyptian pyramids. So if that even puts it in perspective, 28 pyramids to equal the one temple in Jerusalem. This temple was to be the place where heaven and earth would meet and God's presence would dwell among his people. It needed to be a really special place. Second Chronicles 7, 1 Chronicles 7.1 says that God was pleased with the house that Solomon had built him and his glory filled the temple. And this is where we see that God at this time was among his people in the temple. All of God's blessings would remain on Solomon as long as he followed his commands. Solomon started really, really strong, but he failed later in life. In fact, it was said that he actually resembled Pharaoh more than he resembled his father, King David, at the end of his life. He went against every given criteria for a king of Israel. God had said, remember in Deuteronomy, don't acquire horses. He had 40,000 stalls for horses and 12,000 horsemen. He said, don't strive to attain storehouses of riches. Solomon, as we know, was the richest king who ever lived, but he became a tyrant. And a lot of that money and that wealth came from heavily taxing his people. I found this fact, too, that in metal alone, he received 666 talents each year. 
This means that the value of what he got from the people in just metal each year was between 1 to 1.2 trillion U.S. dollars. And do we need to talk about the women in Solomon's life, right? The Lord instructed he, they were to not take many wives. Solomon had over a thousand women. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. I put my notes, whew, talk about a reality show on TLC, right? <laughs> Sister wives, forget about it. What do they have, like four or five, I don't know. A thousand women in his life, 700 wives and 300 concubines. He went against every given instruction of the Lord. And then sadly, he wasn't the only one because the kings that followed him also went against the rules of the Lord. His life is a good example to all of us that small steps of compromise lead to bigger steps of disobedience. When he first started out being king, I'm sure he would have never imagined where he would have ended up. Remember, he was so um, humble and honest when God said, ask anything you want when he was first king. And he said, Lord, just give me your wisdom. And he said, you could have asked for anything, but because you asked for wisdom, I'm going to give you riches and power and wisdom and everything else. And this humble, you know, this humble king starting out ended up being this tyrant at the end. But in the end of his life, he was awakened to that. And he actually wrote the book, God bless you, of Ecclesiastes, where he's saying, vanity, vanity, everything is vanity. I mean, you read that book and your heart just aches because he realizes, I've strived for all of this in my life. And for what? It's for nothing, you know. So, yes. Good, good instructions to heed that just those small steps can lead to bigger steps of disobedience. After Solomon, unfortunately, the nation of Israel was divided into two kingdoms. We have the southern kingdom, who took the name Judah, and uh, King Solomon's son, Rehoboam, ruled that kingdom, but he, read, he ruled with greed and a lust for power, kind of took after his dad's example. Then the northern kingdom kept the name Israel and made Samaria the capital. Their first king was Jeroboam, and he was a really jealous king. In fact, he was so worried about his people going to Jerusalem to worship that he actually set up golden calves in his kingdom for them to go and worship. And then I thought, too, what's up with the golden calves? Is that just me? Like, why are they always putting up golden calves, right? <laughs> So I did a little research, because we remember that in um, Moses' time, when Moses was up on the mountain, Mount Sinai, getting the Ten Commandments from God, and the people were getting impatient and waiting for him, they made a golden calf to worship. And now here again, this king, Rehobo or Jeroboam, puts up two golden calves to worship. And I found that back then, of course, it came from Egyptian pagan god worship, but also it was another symbol for Baal which we see that worship in um, First and Second Kings. Both gods can be um, represented in a bull or a calf, and because it, it signified uh, strength and fertility. So that was the, why they picked a bull. Um, all right, so moving on. Both kingdoms had 20 successive kings. Some were good, most were bad, and some were really bad. The author of First and Second Kings used the following criteria to evaluate each king's reign. Because if you're like me, reading through all these names of these kings, it's like, all right, well, because a lot of times people will start out and they did not follow the Lord. Or they, and they're like, well, wait, I haven't got to a story yet. But the author lines up their rule to determine if they're good or bad by these three things. Did they worship God alone? Did they rid Israel of idolatry? And were they faithful like David to the covenant that God had made with them, or did they become corrupt and unjust? So when we line up all the kings and look at their legacies, the report card is that the southern kingdom, which was um, the original kingdom, that was the, the kingdom of Judah, had eight good kings and 12 bad kings. Some examples of the kings of the southern kingdom, you might recognize some of these names, Hezekiah. He was the king that was told that he was going to die. 
and he went before the Lord and he prayed, please God, just sustain my life, and God did. He extended his life and gave him more years. Josiah was a very, very young king. He was actually made king when he was eight years old. So how many of you have an eight-year-old child or an eight-year-old grandchild, and can you imagine them being king (laughs) of Israel? But he was at eight years old because his dad was assassinated by his servants. So you want some drama? Read the Bible. We don't need to go to movies or watch soap operas. There's some interesting plots in the Bible. It's amazing. There's some good stuff in there. Um, He was a good king. At 18 years old, he found God's book of the law and was convicted because he had it read to him and started hearing about how his people had turned from God. He destroyed all of the pagan idols that his grandfather and his father had made. The high places of worship to worship these false gods, he destroyed all of them. And he reinstated the worship of Jehovah God in Israel. The worst king is King Manasseh, who was actually Josiah's grandfather. He erected idols of pagan gods all over the nation. He introduced corrupt worship to these gods. He was involved in divination and witchcraft in the temple. He desecrated God's temple. And he even used his own children as burned sacrifices to pagan gods. He is considered the worst king. The northern kingdom, all of them were bad. There wasn't one good one. What did I say? Not one good, good one among them. They were all bad. Um, some kings you might be familiar with in the northern kingdom... King Ahab, who was his wife? Jezebel, that's right. She was a wicked woman, wasn't she? And their arch nemesis was the prophet Elijah. This took place in the northern kingdom. My favorite, favorite story in the whole Bible is Elijah with the prophets of Baal when they're up on Mount Carmel. And they do the competition to see about which gods are going to burn up the sacrifices. And I just love how, like, Elijah's taunting them and how then they're all day, you know, just crying out and for Baal to burn the sacrifice, burn the sacrifice. And um, you guys, I won't take time to tell the story, but then when it's Elijah's turn, he has the doused over and over again and to where the water was just filling out of the trenches. And he's like, God, just show them. <laughs> And fire comes down from heaven and just whoosh, burns up the sacrifice, burns up the altars, even burns the stones. You know how hot fire must be to burn stones? Nothing is left because God just shows up and shows off, and I love it. So that took place in the northern kingdom. And then King Jehu came after King Ahab. He was appointed by the Lord, but then turned and ruled with bloodthirst and vengeance. But God time and time again, was patient in allowing his people to repent and return to him. But their hearts were hardened and their ears became deaf to the warnings of the different prophets. So they didn't keep God's covenant. So God removed his hand of protection because he would not allow the adultery of his people to go on to these false pagan gods. And he would not allow his temple to be defiled. So the Israelites were carried off into exile, and Solomon's temple was destroyed in 586 B.C. So now we see God's presence was removed from his people. And Ezekiel 10 and 11 tells us that his glory was no longer in the temple. So now we're going to fast forward a number of decades, and the Israelites are allowed to return to Jerusalem in 539 B.C., and a new temple is built. The same temple that would, in the um, New Testament, years later be known as Herod's temple. If you've heard about that or during Jesus' time, hearing about that, the temple during that time, that's the same temple. This temple remained in Jerusalem until the Romans destroyed it in 70 AD. But it wasn't nearly as grand as Solomon's temple. And the Ark of the Covenant was not uh, located in this temple. And God's glory did not fall in the most holy place. It was just a building. And thinking about that now, that's kind of sad because how many houses of God, our churches, are just buildings, but God's spirit isn't there. We don't ever, ever, ever 
want that for our church where we just go through the motions and we just meet in a building. We want God's spirit to always be present and always fall when his people come together. So during this time, God's presence still remains absent among his people. And many people had thought that God had broken his promise to David and his descendants. But we know that God never breaks his promises. Ever, ever, ever. He was still in control and his ultimate plan of restoration was still in place. All right, we are up to day four on page 85. And the title of that is The King Has Come. And this is where we see the fulfillment of the promises that God made to David. So page 85. Mary was a young virgin who was visited by the angel Gabriel. She's told that she's going to be the mother of the prophesied Messiah, the anointed one of Israel. Growing up, though, she, would, she was a, a, a Jewish girl. She would have grown up in all the traditions and the knowledge and been very familiar with the history of her nation and the prophecies of her people. Gabriel told her in Luke 1, starting in verse 31, You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Does that sound like what God promised David? That their, that kingdom would never end. Um, down on the bottom of page 85, it says, People had thought God, God's promise to David of a throne that lasted forever meant his earthly dynasty would last forever. But Gabriel said that this child would reign forever. Our eternal king is Jesus. Gabriel told her in verse 35 that he would be the son of God. So this revealed Jesus' literal relationship to their God and king, Yahweh. He established the truth that this baby she was being entrusted with was the true descendant of King David, the one that they had all been waiting for. On page 86, John's gospel tells us that Jesus was the word of God who became flesh and dwelt among us. This blew me away. This I just kind of sat for a little while and just had to ponder. The word dwelt is literally tabernacled. The glory of the Lord had finally come to the temple. So in John, when he says that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God who became flesh and dwelt among us for a while, what he's saying is Jesus was the human physical form of the most holy of holies. And when Jesus came to earth, he reinstated God's connection with his people. God's presence was now again with his people, Israel. And I just thought that was so beautiful. I love this too. I'll never read this verse the same. Matthew 1.23 makes reference to a prophecy about the Messiah. It says, we're familiar with this at Christmas time. Behold, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Isn't that beautiful? Jesus not only came to die on the cross to redeem, of, redeem us of our sins, but to reinstate that relationship with God that the Israelites had forfeited because of their disobedience. But God in his grace and mercy and loving kindness wanted to reconnect uh, with his people, and he did that through Jesus. Jesus could have just come and died and atoned for our sins, but how beautiful that he really was the embodiment of that most holy of holies again. Um, because Jesus atoned our sins through death and proved that he is the eternal king through his resurrection, we now, get this, y'all, can have God's present, his very spirit in us. All right, drop the mic, right? Okay, we've just learned this whole process about how 
David wanted to make a, a house for God, but he couldn't do it, so he had, had to have Solomon do it, and it was very specific, and it was this beautiful, unbelievable place so that, you know, once a year, God's spirit could come and rest on the Ark of the Covenant, and that was only if they kept every single rule and did every single sacrifice right and just in hopes that God's spirit would fall that day. Then they mess up. God takes that gift away that he can no longer commune with them because of their sin, sends Jesus to recreate that bond, and now gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit. He allows us to be the temple of the Lord. It makes me think of the verse like, who, who am I, Lord, that you would consider me? You know, like, that just blows me away. And these are things that we've heard probably over our Christian lives over and over again. But this just rang so true to me, like, wow, God, you really are amazing, and you love us so much, and you're so kind and gracious that this beautiful, do I need to read the amount of the temple again? I mean, come on, right? His spirit went there, but he entrusts us with that now? Isn't that beautiful? Amazing. But how does this happen? How do we receive God's spirit? We receive God's spirit in us when we accept Christ's gift of salvation. Ephesians 1.13 says, And you were also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. We belong to God now. He has marked us as his children by sealing us with his very spirit. And that's just amazing. We're so undeserving. And thank you, Jesus, for paying the price for our sin so that we can have that communion with God again. We Christians are now the temple of the living God. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Don't you know that, yourself, that you yourselves are God's temple? God's spirit lives in you. A physical place for sacrifice to atone for sins is no longer needed. And a singular sanctified room for God's presence to abide is obsolete. Because through Jesus, we now are able to have God's spirit in us. The Old Testament, in the Old Testament, God's spirit would come upon people to temporarily empower them for certain tasks or to deliver a prophecy, such as Moses, Joshua, Samson, God's spirit would come on him, David, Isaiah to prophesy, but it was temporary and not permanent. In fact, we see that David in Psalm 51 asked the Lord to not take his Holy Spirit from him. It was not until Jesus came and died as the final sacrifice and paid the debt for our sins that we now as believers and the children of God can permanently house God's spirit. We don't have to worry about losing him. Once we are Christians and we're sealed with the Holy Spirit and we belong to God, we're his. We don't ever have to worry about that. This truth is now so clearly evident to us, but it's what the Jewish people of Jesus' time totally missed out on. Israel was looking for their Messiah to rule on this earth in the line of David. He was going to be a mighty ruler and a mighty king. He was going to overthrow the Roman government and restore Israel's rightful place. They were more interested in the Messiah being a righteous ruler than their resurrected redeemer. Sadly, most Jews today are still blind to the fact that Jesus is their promised Messiah, unless they are what's called a completed Jew or a Messianic Jew. And if you, I was fortunate to grow up with one in our church. Um, we all just called her Grandma Sharon because she was like the, the grandma of the church and she was a completed Jew. And what a beautiful relationship because she had the knowledge and the respect of the heritage she grew up in but then had the fulfillment of Jesus as her savior. And it was just really, kind of made you a little jealous. Like, whoa, you're like doubly chosen or something. You know what I mean? But yes, so many times, they're still looking for the Messiah. And it's like, he's come, he's, he's come, you can have him, you know. 
Jesus came the first time to fulfill the Davidic covenant and all the prophecies foretold to him. But most importantly, he came to complete God's redemption plan. And when he comes again, it will be, take, it will be to take his rightful place as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. During his three years of ministry on earth, a few recognized his true identity. When Peter was asked, Jesus asked him, who do you say I am? He said, you are the Messiah. Peter knew. Do you guys remember blind Bartimaeus, the beggar on the side that would call out to Jesus? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He knew that he was the son of God come through David. Even Pontius Pilate asked Jesus if he was the king of the Jews. Jesus answered yes and then told him, but my kingdom is not of this world. And then Pilate made a sign kind of mocking him to hang above Jesus on the cross, but the words were still true. And they said, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. Jesus came as the king of the Jews, but more importantly, he came as the redeemer of all mankind. And he's coming back again. <laughs> His kingdom is in heaven, and he's coming back for us to rule and reign for eternity with him. And just as David was promised in 1 Samuel 7, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me, and your throne will be established forever. Revelation 11.15 tells us that the kingdom of this world will be restored to its rightful owner, Jesus Christ. Verse 15 says, the seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. And in Revelation 19, we get a glimpse of what we will see when Jesus returns to reign forever as the promised eternal king. Verse 11 says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. There's the reference to John 1.1 1, 1 again. The armies of, the, of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. In verse 16, on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's coming back, you guys. He's fulfilled every promise up till now. He, he fulfilled the promises given to Adam and Eve. He came and fulfilled the covenant promises given to Abraham and the people of Israel. And he came and fulfilled the covenant promises given to David. So I would say that it's safe for us today to look ahead in expectation to him coming again to fulfill all of the promises that he's given us as co-heirs, children of God, and citizens of his eternal kingdom in heaven.